Um, hola. I hope you see that. I don't speak any Spanish, but I understood some of the stuff that Andres uh, said telling you about. I'm really glad to, to be here. So, me llamo, Tiana, um, and I work for Tate, and Tate is a family of four galleries. Um, two of those are based in London, Tate Modern and Tate Britain, and two we have elsewhere in the UK, Tate Liverpool and Tate St. Ives, and we present art from 1500 onwards. Uh, I don't know if you had the chance to visit London and, and see see the collections, but if you do, come and uh, let me know if, if you're coming and be glad to have you around, show you around. So um, this is my first time on the Southern Hemisphere, and I feel a bit like uh, Mafalda, who is a great uh, character, and uh, I bought some comic books for my kids to take back and introduce them to Argentinian <laughs> comics. Um, so I was, um, yeah, afraid I'm going to fall off planet Earth. So Apart from this change in perspective, I think I found lots of similarities already uh, in Argentina. And uh, for example, in language, you say digital, the same thing. Transformation, exactly the same. And uh, yeah, let's uh, try and make it happen. I come from the museum sector, so this presentation is mostly going to be about museums and other cultural institutions are probably very different from what Marcella was talking about and the scope of context is slightly different but I feel it will be relevant to you just seeing the list of all the people who are here. I hope you'll find it uh, useful although I don't, as Marcella said already, don't have answers to all of the questions but it's good to have a debate. Um, so it's without a question that our cultural institutions have to embrace digital technologies. We, we have to stay up to date with everything that's happening around us in this environment we live in. Uh, but we need to shake up our business models and we need to shake up our organizational structures as well and fully embrace this digital landscape to be able to remain relevant in today's society. And in today's presentation, uh, I will be, uh, I've divided it into sort of three parts. So I'll give a bit of a historical context to it. Then I will briefly introduce to you, well, briefly, the most of the presentation will talk about the factors for successful digital transformation. Um, and then I will uh, briefly talk to you about transforma digital transformation that happened at, at Tate as a kind of a case, case study. So, Let's go back 100 years ago. So what happened around 100 years ago? They would have installed electric lights in our buildings. Yeah? And these kind of signs you would be able to, to find stuck on the walls. The room is equipped with Edison electric light. Do not attempt to light with match. Simply turn key on the wall by the door. Okay? That must have been a really, really huge uh, change and had a huge impact on operational side as well as the the experience uh, that the museums and other buildings were, were having. And also around that time, back in 1930s, slightly later, H.G. Wells got this idea of a world brain and the notion of world brain in 1937. Um, it was at the time of the rise of press and printed materials. Um, there was significant increase in available information. So does that bring some you know, kind of bells and parallels with the today's world when we're talking about this abundance of, of data and information. So that resulted in a growing need to classify that information and make it more accessible through all the available means that they had. They obviously had different media than we, we have to today. And back then, museums and galleries were really uh, representatives of this driving force of, of knowledge collection, yes? There were, there were at that sort of a level. And also around that time, uh, one, one of your Ar Argentines, Borges, said, I have always imagined that paradise will be a kind of a library. So where museums and cultural institutions have traditionally been seen as these temples of knowledge, they're now facing competition from all other content uh, providers. So if you go fast to 2015, like from last year's World Science Festival, which took place in New York in June 2014, and based on some scientific research, they said we will have Wi-Fi in our, our brains soon. Um, 
these are little tiny microchips uh, that have been developed to be implanted in our brains and they're called brain drops or neural dust. And what sort of impact is that going to have on, on museums? We don't know yet. Um, and today also Google is really competing, something that Marcel already mentioned, who are our competitors, uh, not other museums, not other cultural institutions, not other publishers. Google is uh, competing with cultural institutions and one of their goals is actually to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Isn't that what museums are trying to do with their collections? So are we finding ourselves culturally irrelevant or are we in a sort of identity crisis? So how can cultural institutions stay relevant in, 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 this, in today's world? And what will be this next big technological breakthrough that we would need to con yet to consider? Um, and how, do we, how can we exploit these digital technologies and stay faithful to our missions? So this graph um, is uh, a graph I've taken from a Horizon report. Um, and just for those who are not familiar, if you haven't heard of a Horizon, Horizon reports identify emerging technologies every year, year on year, and they started off uh, producing reports for education sector, but nowadays they do that for museums as well. They're an uh, American-based uh, uh, research company. And this re uh, report shows you the rise and fall of different technologies through, through time. So you can see how something was really le relevant in 2005 and then very kind of died out by 2010 and the new technologies, new platforms, new channels have, have taken, taken over. So considering this kind of waves of new technologies, it is very fast paced, very different to the museums and our cultural institutions, which are usually called dinosaurs. Um, and it's a never ending story of really, really changing uh, landscape. So what is next for the museums? Different museums seem to be taking completely different approach to technology. So only, I think, uh, last month, this was on the news that the Met banned uh, selfie sticks usage in, in their museum. Whereas this is the news from two days ago. There is an art museum, actually, just developed for taking selfies. So you can see that it really depends what you, what you want. What, 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 is your, what is your mission? So very, very different approaches um, to this. But what becomes apparent is that we're not only talking about this digital transformation. It is organizational transformation. It, is, it has to be an organizational change and it has to be understood as such. Otherwise, you will fail. You can't do digital transformation. I call this presentation digital transformation only because it's a, a buzzword. It's easy to find on search engines. <laughs> Otherwise, if you put organizational change, you get uh, lost uh, uh, in, in the sea of information. And that transformation is actually a consequence of, of, this, uh, of this change that is happening around us constantly. And uh, sometimes it's more prominent. So that was the historic bit. Uh, hopefully you will see that w this is nothing new for humankind. These technological changes have been happening. It is just that these days there's so many of it changing constantly that uh, we are a bit lost. So now I'm going to take you through some sort of what I call ingredients for a successful digital transformation. And this is based on my research on reading books and talking to different people and seeing what's been happening around me. So you know, lo there is lots of sort of similar uh, lists, but I'll give you my view of what, what I think you definitely need in order to have a successful digital transformation. Just to also say that uh, there are different kinds of digital transformations, so just try to apply this to your, to your context. Sometimes it will be that you want to digitize your collection, sometimes it will be that you want to do audience engagement. All of these will require some kind of organizational uh, change in order for you to be more successful. So, for a successful digital transformation, you will need, ingredient number one would be, you need a digital leader. It's a kind of a obvious thing, but in so many cases it's not so obvious to our uh, leaders. Um, and this is, I think, the key factor. And this is something that's proven at Tate, definitely, without a, a digital leadership that demands a new way of thinking, 
you cannot change a lot. So you need that person with digital skills at the very high levels of the organization, at the executive level. So someone who is making decisions needs to be educated uh, in digital technologies, needs to have that experience. And uh, we've seen a big rise uh, recently in America, in the UK. I'm not sure whether in Argentina something like that is happening, but you're getting new sort of uh, so-called chief digital officers roles, like at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, at State, we are just hiring the new digital director, but the idea was in the beginning to call it a chief digital officer, and so on and on. The MoMA has also got a new uh, a recent, from two years ago, again, digital uh, director of content and strategy. Is the same of community management? Is it same? I don't think so, no. This is a very high level person making strategic decisions. I think a community manager, at least in the UK context, would be someone who is actually in kind of um, doing the implication of strategy and doing the work. Um, but I think that what that person definitely needs to have is a, an authority. If you don't have the authority, then you'll be in big trouble, I think, and nothing will you won't be able to do much. Um, the good thing is that uh, museum directors are talking about digital. So this is a quote from Nicholas Sarota, who is a director of Tate. The quote is from actually 2013, but it um, was published in a report done by COGAP, that is a very uh, kind of uh, popular, famous digital agency in the UK, and they work with lots of museums around the, around the world. Um, and it just shows you that um, th there is definitely a recognition that digital technologies are important. How much they're willing to do about, you know, what they're willing to do about it, that's another, that's another thing. But COGAP have done face-to-face -face interviews with different chief executives and uh, digital managers and heads of digital, and um, they came out with a certain set of recommendations. And if you find it on the internet, uh, please um, uh, re read it. It's quite interesting. And it's a good one to send to your leaders in your organizations, to your decision makers, uh, to make them probably uh, more literate. But over half of the digital uh, managers in this survey believe that their senior managers have a very poor understanding of digital. and. Uh, they saw that as a barrier to their own work and their own success in what they're trying to do, maybe as a community manager. Um, and uh, I would say today, just one of the recommendations that is relevant is to, they said uh, that you need to make your senior team more digitally literate. How you do that? I'll leave that to you. We can maybe talk about that later. But otherwise, you are doomed for a very, very frustrating journey because this insufficient digital literacy and misunderstanding of what is digital production, how to lead digital production among the leadership, would just continue to lead you to some unrealistic expectations and mutual trans frustration, because you won't have the same language. They wouldn't know when you say user experience and content, they wouldn't know what you mean by that. They wouldn't know when you say front-end or back-end development, so there is some sort of um, something to be done on that. Ingredient number two for the successful digital uh, trans transformation is to have a clear vision. It's uh, very, very obvious, um, and I suppose that all organizations have their visions already written down, and you just need to always constantly go back to, to that, and um, I think that's really, really important. Um, so what you are trying to achieve is actually um, what will make you more successful if you stick to, to, your, to your aims. Um, and then you can just integrate technology to help you solve your business problems, to help you do what you're trying to do with your audiences, what you're trying to offer to your audiences, but kind of stay true to, to yourselves rather than try to be someone else. Um, then the next one is really shared objectives. I work at Tate, which has got 800 people working, God knows how many departments, and each department probably has their own objectives. So unless we all understand and have common objectives, we can't be successful. So th th this, these need to be aligned um, across different business uh, units. And this will always enable you just better integration of the different digital activities. 
because working in the digital sector, you actually end up working in very multi-skilled teams. It is never one person's job to create anything in digital. Yeah. So this kind of cross-functional alignment is also being defined in different literature and uh, research has shown that it's very important for any kind of uh, successful digital transformation. Then you need a strategic plan or a strategy. I don't necessarily believe that you need a paper and you need to write down your strategy, but you still need to have a plan, sort of a to-do list. How are you going to achieve those aims? How are you going, what are you going to do in order to achieve your mission? Um, and uh, to be and to, to stay strategic museums must review its business strategy constantly. So at state we have strategies that cover every two years, which is seen as a kind of a long enough period to be able to actually achieve something, but it's not too long that you actually start failing. So you set yourself for failure if you put a five-year strategy uh, in terms of digital. We're talking about digital maybe in some other ways. And if you're talking about collection acquisition, it might make sense to have a five-year or 10-year strategy or exhibition. So I'm just talking about this in the digital context. And uh, yes, Data has produced uh, a digital strategy, which uh, is very transparent. It's available on, on our website, so have a look. It's just one of the, one of the examples, and uh, there are many, many others. Smithsonian's got, also got really nice uh, wiki pages where they publish all sorts of documents. So there's lots of, there's lots of kind of transparency and openness uh, in the community with, when it comes to documentation, and people write brilliant blogs also about all this kind of stuff. Um, ingredient number five is really having a digital roadmap. So we went from vision to objectives and then really to your to-do list. So digital roadmap is just really a to-do list of all the projects that you set out to do that cover your strategy. And to me, this is, this is something that um, is the most important communication tool internally important tool to take with you into the meeting. So if someone comes to you and says, we want an app, or they, they want to steer you away from what you have set out <coughs> to do, you can always bring that document with you. It also helps to uh, keep those common objectives in mind, to know why you're here, what, and keeps you focused. And uh, that has been something that I believe we've successfully done at State last year. So this is an example of a uh, plan, um, uh, a roadmap for Tate. Actually, it's a, a PowerPoint uh, template, which I found on the internet. So you can have a, have a look at it. I think it costs something like $5 or something like that. And uh, then you can start uh, sort of uh, pl playing, playing with that. And uh, di different uh, colors here just shows you the different types of uh, digital production. Uh, so for example, yellow presents digital production that involves only content. So no development of platforms involved. Whereas the red ones are big technological uh, changes and more complex uh, projects. There are some blues there, which were the things mentioned, and they are still to be confirmed whether they will be done, so they could easily become uh, red or not. But um, yes, so it's an internal document. I'm sorry I can't uh, kind of uh, share that one with you, but uh, I can uh, definitely share the link to the uh, template that if you're interested, you can use. Um, for me, ingredient number six, but not in order of priority, I would say that user-centric thinking is the word um, in the street today and something that Marcel was also saying quite a lot in his presentation, really you need to know your audiences and you need to become more user-centric organization rather than inward-looking organization and it needs to be more user-led. So how do you do that? By investing a lot more in audience uh, research. In the UK, I know that lots of museums are investing in audience research. At Tate we have two posts who are looking just at audience research, one person who is um, audience insight manager and she deals with all the in focus groups and regular in gallery surveys concerned with the kind of physical uh, visitors that come through to the gallery and then in the digital department we have a digital analyst who looks just into the analytics and mostly Google analytics but also follows uh, analytics of all the kind of social media platforms that we have and uh, less so on, uh, on apps I think we can still be better uh, with that but um, so on a kind of a cross-institutional 
levels. Uh, there, there are also def different <coughs> regular benchmarks that are done in the UK. So there is one research company, uh, Maurice Hargreave McIntyre, who work with lots of cultural institutions. So what they've done, they've created like a forum for different institutions so that we can share our thoughts and ideas and segmentations and so on and on. So it is easier to recognize trends and also to be able to benchmark yourself against uh, other institutions. So this is just an example of, for example, Tate's motivational segments uh, that uh, are currently being uh, used. Uh, this is from 2013 and 14. And um, so based on research, what do we know about our visitors? We know <coughs> that high proportions of Tate modern audiences are from overseas. We know that Tate Britain's audiences tend to be older. We know that Tate Liverpool has got older but more exhibition-centric audience. And Tate St. Ives mostly gets tourists in. Obviously, this is just the sort of the, the, the above layer of what you can find out. We have m many, many more information about uh, about our visitors, but it is really helping us achieve some, um, make some decisions into kind of specifically when it comes to which digital channels we would like to use. Um, so, apart from this kind of uh, research that is done uh, inside Tate, uh, we also look at uh, trends such as this one, how many UK adults actually have internet access at home and how it is increasing or decreasing. Well, mostly it is increasing. Uh, what is the mobile phone internet access? How many uh, online visits were made to social media sites? Or how many UK adults are using social net networks? Also, it shows us that Facebook is still the most popular social networking uh, site and about one third of the UK population visit the site on a daily basis. So all of these research studies help us make better decisions and I would highly recommend that means being user centric really. Um, we also recently uh, done a Tate website segmentation so we've done a survey in 2014 and we wanted to segment audiences in the digital sphere. It was the easiest to do that for the website first, so we haven't done research across all the digital uh, channels, which is probably the next thing we would need to do. So we also recognize sort of different motivations for people, why they're coming to the website, um, what are they looking for, and which sort of content they're consuming more or less, and also looking at their satisfaction, which is now going to be used next year to sort of re redevelop the, the website. So yeah, user tech centric uh, thinking, I, I would say, of all the things, if you can do that first, that's something you can do first, probably, and that could be under your control. Maybe you can't change your digital leader straight away, but some things you can do first. Um, ingredient number seven, big data. Again, it was already mentioned today, but collecting personal data has become a great commodity, and I think it gives, a kind of, getting into the big data business will give you an advantage over other competitors. The cultural institutions don't see each other too often as competitors and we don't really have that sort of business thinking. I'm talking from the UK perspective again, maybe you do things differently here, but I think we, we need to understand that we are running businesses and that we need to get visitors through the doors and we need to be very clear about what is our cultural product that we are selling. Is it the collection? Is it exhibitions? Is it our apps? Maybe all of those but we need to kind of decide. And um, this big data business can, can really, really help us to get to know our users, to be able to stay in touch with them and have a better customer relations uh, with, with them. A good example is the Dallas Museum of Art, who have obviously introduced the uh, DMA Friends scheme. And uh, when you go to the museum, I had the opportunity to go there last year. So they track you as a as a visitor as you go through the museum. It is still very much a kind of a physical digital experience. It's not perfect, but still I think they're ga gaining some invaluable data as to kind of which work of art in the museum are, is most likely to be visited, which activity families are more likely to offer to their children, so on and on, so they can adjust their offer. So the collaborative nature, as I mentioned already, of digital activities makes it difficult or almost impossible to plan digital activity in a siloed, hierarchical organization. So you cannot be just one department, one person planning for your activity. You absolutely have to work with others. So having that sort of networking culture is very, very important to spread that. And it's really a cr 
critical uh, success factor for uh, if you would really like to transform your organization. You must work collaboratively in sort of cross-disciplinary teams. I'm not saying you don't need to sit all together in one department. How do you sort of organize or restructure your organizations? It doesn't really matter, but it, you need to be able to, um, uh, to, to grow that, cu that culture. And uh, because uh, I believe that participation always starts inside. So if one of your aims is audience engagement and participation, how will you make that happen if you don't participate and talk uh, uh, with, with your colleagues? Um, it's really showing by example. Um, digital skills. Well, digital skills are not a core competency of people working in museums. And we are not startups and we are not all developers. Yes, we, we come from completely different sort of backgrounds, art historians, and you name it. And so how to get digital skills, you, you either do it by obviously recruiting digital specialists or providing some training and fine tuning people's uh, job descriptions to reflect the need of, uh, of, these, of these skills. Uh, ingredient number 11, clear processes and procedures. Well, uh, this is something that's very dear to me because this is, as a digital production leader, Tate, I do this kind of stuff on a, on a daily basis and I think about it quite a lot, how we can be more efficient and how we need to create new workflows and so on and on, uh, documentation that you need. So all that is part of building your processes and procedures for better, more efficient uh, digital production. So less time wasted, less frustrations and sort of more, more focus. And um, so we are constantly creating a lot of documents. So if you don't have them, be prepared that if you're going through transformation, you will need to allocate lots and lots of time for actually boring documentation writing. Because if you're gonna go for audience engagement, you do need those moderation guidelines. Yeah? If you're gonna work with kids, you need certain guidelines for working with kids and so on and on. All of these things take, take time and uh, energy and lots of thinking. And they, they are extremely, extremely important uh, part of transforming your organization because I suppose these just don't exist. Um, and uh, the, the, this is the example, again, uh, still in consultation phase of a digital production process diagram that uh, I've created for Tate. And so at the top are uh, just sort of, I want to. <laughs> and this is just shows to different people, like if you want a blog, if you want to make an app, if you want a web page, you want a new microsite, and so on, and on. different examples of stuff that people coming to my department with. And then we would say, okay, if that is the case, then you either go to do this workflow, that for workflow, and so on and on. Again, this yellow covers sort of content, so it could happen quite quickly, decision making and the production. Whereas if you have more complex, then you go through completely different uh, boards and a decision making uh, process. Further down, when you are in the production, there are certain sort of documents that would need to be produced as part of that stage or uh, mm -hmm. if you are, for example, um, evaluation is at the bottom because we are trying to change the processes in such a way that we start with evidence-based, um, lots of analytics and research done beforehand before we even start and m make sort of the statement of work for each, for each project and then to do evaluation at the end to know whether we've been successful or, or, or not. So this is just a kind of a framework but also I'm using that to sort of um, uh, to, to train people across the organization about what it means to do digital production because everyone thinks you can have a website in a day and that's absolutely not true. It takes about three years. <laughs> uh, also as part of that process, um, we've developed something which we call Digital Brief, which basically asks if anyone comes to us with a new idea, that something that is out of ordinary, something that is not part of our business as usual sort of uh, process, we would uh, ask them to write down a digital brief. So it's, it's been sort of uh, sold internally as in, hey, this is a document that is helping you put your thoughts on paper. This is not something that I'm asking you as administrative measure and I don't want to waste your time, but I really want you to think about all these things. So you need to think about your project objectives, about alignment with the strategy, with the mission, you need to think about the project schedule. Do you have a deadline uh, that is maybe be, being imposed by your funder? Uh, do you have any funders and uh, different stakeholders? Because that always complicates the, the project because maybe you haven't recognized what their objectives are and why they are here. 
uh, do you have any communication plan and so on and on sort of audiences uh, any risks ideas and once we get that back we have a, a team of people who look into that and it's a process of iterative process of kind of going back and forth until we are, we are happy with what is being proposed and that go then goes to the uh, decision makers and uh, that's been quite successful I have to say um, in sort of stopping loads of projects also recognizing that two briefs from different departments are actually very similar and bringing those people together and actually creating not one, not two projects which should take double amount of everyone's time but creating one project that is actually going to have probably a higher impact. And fi finally, and something that we don't think about is, uh, and I really strongly believe uh, that it's very important, is we need a new funding and financial procedures. It's like too, too, too many times I see that we are getting funding as institutions in an opportunistic way just because someone is offering us money rather than going back to our mission and saying, okay, what do we want to fundraise for? What do we care for? Rather than then just becoming agents for someone else's, um, someone else's needs. Uh, that's probably the hardest one to, to tackle. It's a part of the whole system, it's a part of the culture, but I think it's important to have debates and discussions about it, how and whether you can, I think always some things can change if you spend enough time thinking about them and doing something about them. So what we have at Tate, and I'm sure it's a case everywhere else, is that the funds are very often attached to individual projects. And as such, it is really seen as a barrier for us creating something that is more sustainable. Um, so if, if my principle is to create a sustainable uh, digital technology enabled content for Tate, but I have 10 projects that I still have to work on because of the fun, fun, funding requirement, then it's taking my energy energy away so something to think about I don't know like it would be great to hear if someone's got success stories and kind of how you've changed your um, uh, fun, fun, funding uh, arrangements also what we see is that um, fun funding procedures at Tate come through a completely different department development department who then end up acting as digital producers running projects being project managers whereas actually they are there their role I believe is to get the money for the right things for the organization and pass on the, the, the work, the actual production to people who know how to produce stuff. Enough said on that. So just a kind of uh, a, a slide that you can maybe take a photo of or a kind of uh, takeaways. Take These are all the ingredients um, that I've been talking about, about today and they're all important. Shall I wait for photo? <laughs> Well, I think that the presentation is going to be online at some point, so that uh, you'll, you'll have opportunity to see all the slides. Um, and now I'm um, going to talk to you about some uh, a bits of digital transformation at Tate and what it meant, because uh, it's probably different for every organisation. So, to go slightly back in time, the, the, we launched our uh, website as it currently stands back in 2012. It took us about two years um, of production and probably another year of kind of thinking about it. So in total about three years to produce it and uh, because the project overhauled the whole of the website. So we changed the design, we changed the, the content management system, the platform, information <coughs> architecture, backend system, servers and so on. So it was a big, a big project. And during this two year period that the work was undertaken by uh, the, what is sort of now Tate Digital and then Tate Online Department, which consists of about 10 people, plus we had lots of freelancers working, the world around us was changing. So we were committed to do one thing, whereas around us, uh, you know, uh, social media was, uh, was booming, different departments were starting to build new digital communities. Uh, there were digital roles appearing in different departments without any connection to the central department. Uh, boundaries between these different organizational functions be became really blurry and uh, new digital initiatives that we've been asked to do were e also more complex. So we, we needed to change something and uh, so you know you need to transform if you have any of these problems. So if you have like a clearly defined digital leadership and decision making. If you ask yourself a lot of the times, question who who is making decision about this? Who shall I go to? You need to do something about it. If you're lacking clearly defined strategy, 
and objectives for digital activities, if you're having this opportunistic approach to, to, to funding, if you are working in a siloed, project-based way, and if your roles are, at the end of the day, uh, and responsibilities unclear. So all of these were um, re relevant to us, and I'm sure it will be relevant to, yeah, some people are nodding. <laughs> um, so uh, Tate's digital transformation project of, um, what was set up as a project because we wanted to be kind of recognized as a team that is working on this. And it stopped in uh, February 2014 when we got a new managing director. So when we lost the, the leader of the, of the project and the new person came in with new ideas, the project kind of died out. But it, this is not to say that the transformation has stopped. It's just the, the, the way it was approached um, is now slightly different with new people. So there's been lots of changes um, in the past year date at a very senior level so that obviously everyone came with the different ideas and everybody wants to kind of leave a, leave a stamp um, but the project aimed to do all, all of these six things uh, wanted to establish a, a digital culture to embed digital practice at Tate to embed digital skills to introduce new transparent production processes and digital governance uh, to operationalize digital disruption and to change the practice of the Tate Digital Department to be able to actually uh, support uh, these changes. Um, so I'll take you briefly through, through all, all of these, although you can read about it online. We have a, a page about the project on our website, which is um, offered as a link in one of the slides. So establishing a digital culture, what that meant for us, we wanted to maximize the potential of digital in all of Tate's um, activities so that uh, digital is not seen as something that is done separately, but it is an aspect of Tate's work in, in anything that Tate uh, does. Sometimes digital isn't a solution. Yeah? Sometimes a PDF is good enough and a paper and pen are good enough. But um, so we just wanted to have the sort of um, uh, opportunity to think about digital when we think about anything that's happening at Tate. Also, we, uh, by uh, embedding digital practice across state, we meant uh, that we wanted to establish a hub and spoke model where we have one main department uh, as a hub um, that uh, is full of digital specialists and then have spokes or maybe digital editors and people who are working very closely with the, with the hub department. So just one way of, do it, of um, doing that. Some organizations do completely devolve their uh, digital production and s set them up in different teams, in different sort of organizational functions. So this was just the model that we wanted to introduce through this digital transformation. Um, we wanted to embed digital uh, skills across state because, um, as I said, uh, digital is not a core competency uh, uh, at, at Tate. And uh, there was a set of new digital competencies that were supposed to be established for, for staff. For example, everyone should know how to write a blog, how to tweet, how to use analytics. I think we've done a great job with analytics, and there's analytics training that's provided to all staff at Tate. But other than that, I don't think that we really uh, can take one, this one off, off the list. Uh, introduce new transparent production processes in digital governance. Uh, yes, you've seen that uh, there's been some attempt to change the digital production process, and it's, uh, it's an ongoing thing. So I'm constantly saying across the organization that it's a test, and I would like to evaluate, and I would like to do that in a kind of iterative uh, way, rather than say from today on, this is how we are doing stuff. It should be an iterative process, and uh, because some things, it, it's a framework. It, it's not a rule. It's a framework by, by which we, we will be more successful in what, in what we do. Um, to operationalize digital disruption. I really don't agree with this one, but um, <laughs> off record. And I'm not 100% sure what it was meant to produce at the end of the day, what the output would be. But I suppose uh, what it said is that it would enable our organization to respond effectively to the emerging opportunities that new technologies could bring to Tate. We never actually sat down and discussed that uh, uh, fully, what that would mean. Would that mean that we use, uh, like at Google, 20% uh, of uh, our time to work on stuff that is completely unrelated to our daily jobs and we become sort of uh, startups? Or I, I don't know, do we invite, you know, and do like uh, hackathons or? So we, we didn't come to that. It would be interesting to, to see like what it could have uh, become, and maybe it will 
you know, uh, be, become something in, in, in the past, in the future. And to change the practice of our uh, Tate Digital uh, department, uh, well, we were supposed to act, and we do act uh, mo more often than not as facilitators of uh, different, uh, for different digital production uh, projects. Uh, we uh, are collaborators, we are encouraging people to work together, and uh, we are also educators and mentors to others. So I feel that that is definitely become our role in the past uh, two, two years, more often than just doing the digital uh, production itself. So what is the project's uh, legacy? Well, we created a new uh, hub department, Tate Digital, um, and we created some new um, uh, roles in that department. Uh, there is a new digital, then new digital strategy written. It definitely, what happened in the organization in the past two or three years is this shift towards user-centered and evidence-based, uh, more sustainable approach to digital production. Uh, we delivered a new website audience segmentation, which is again helping us in that uh, user-centered approach. We definitely work in more collaborative uh, ways and uh, there are currently happening lots of changes in the digital governance, so we're going to have a new role of a digital director and also just as of last week uh, there was an announcement that we're going to have a new editorial board, so the whole kind of content is going to uh, be looked at in a very different and more mature way. So I feel that after kind of looking back in 2000 and let's say 13, we are every day we are more mature in our approach to, to digital. So yes, some kind of a transformation is definitely happening. And uh, but it would take a while. As I said, it's most of these changes. Digital transformation means organizational change. So it would take some time to show any significant difference to to our uh, users. And uh, if you do go for digital transformation, just don't expect it to be smooth, uh, because what you're changing, you're changing the organizational culture, you're changing people's behavior, which is probably the hardest thing in the world to do. I can't change the behavior of my two children. <laughs> it's uh, not a whole organization. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and I think that that organizational change always starts with an uh, individual change. I had to change a lot. I had to change the way I talk to people. I have to stop calling my colleagues my stakeholders. Yes, first of all, so we are all uh, teammates. <laughs> so it is about changing the language as well, quite, quite a lot. So the books I've been reading has been mostly about kind of behavioral psychology <laughs> rather than uh, di digital uh, production and such. Um, but. Um, Th this curve uh, was stolen from friend of a friend of someone I found on the internet, so um, I have to put a reference to that one. But actually, it's based on a curve uh, that was originally designed. It's a curve of change, like when you when someone dies, you go through a mourning uh, uh, process. This this is what people usually go through. So the same applies apparently to uh, to a life of a project, um, and it was done by a, a person called Elizabeth. Kubler Ross, so um, as, as a reference. And so, I mean, to, to finish off, many museums have obviously realized, and you're all here, you all realize that digital technology, you need to do something about digital technologies, uh, but you're just not sure what, what to do <coughs> with it. And th these are definitely powerful tools for communication, but, and strategically, they can bring many benefits to the museum. But I think that um, what we should not forget is that we are in the driver's seat, and these are just vehicles. These are tools that help us do something else. And that something else, that's down to you to decide what is it that you want to do. These are the solutions to your problems. And uh, just try use them wisely so they don't become your problems as well. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>